Welcome back to another episode of History in Your Own Backyard. I'm your host, Susie Selleck, here today in Cincinnati, Ohio, at the CGNP Terminal. And I'm joined by Jeffrey Jacowick. Jeffrey, thank you again, because um, it's nice to have you back. Yes, thank you very much. So I established, you know, where we are, but I think you can really tell us about where we are. Yes, yeah, so it doesn't look like we're hardly anywhere now, but this was the terminal area of the Cincinnati, Georgetown, and Portsmouth. It was a narrow gauge railroad um, that was built between here and projected to Portsmouth um, in the early 1870s. And this was their uh, terminal station, yards, maintenance facilities, and all that. Gotcha. And when you say narrow gauge, you mean what? So a normal railroad, the, uh, the space between the tracks is four feet, eight and a half inches. Mm -hmm. There's some uh, broad gauge tracks that are five foot, two and a half, six feet, but there is also narrow gauge. And typically that was three feet between the rails. Okay. So that was supposed to be cheaper to build, cheaper to operate, and just generally more economical for secondary routes and uh, territories that couldn't really support perhaps a full-size railroad. Right, right, yeah. Okay. So we're not we're not really close to downtown, so I guess we're closer to the little Miami. Yes. All right, so how, um, how did that work? So anyone who was gonna be heading out to points east that were served by the Cincinnati, Georgetown, and Portsmouth um, would generally take a train from downtown to Carroll Street, that's the street that we're on here, uh, where there was a station on the Little Miami Railroad. Um, and then they transfer by new ticket, head out uh, to wherever they were going. Okay. Now, they generally only operated maybe three, four trains per day, so it wasn't particularly frequent service. Right. Um, but for occasional long distance travel and hauling freight, um, originally they were intending to go all the way to Portsmouth and Jackson County to haul coal from, uh, from there to the Cincinnati market. Uh, but another railroad, uh, the Cincinnati and Eastern reached Portsmouth first. And so they weren't able to raise enough funds to extend any farther. And basically once they reached Georgetown in the mid 1880s, they were kind of finished with construction. Um, and that's as, mostly as far as they ever went. Okay. Well, thank you for being with us on a quick little location change as the weather kind of picked up. So we're now under, what are we calling this? The loading? The loading platform. The loading platform. Which so, we'll get to. <laughs> which we will get to. But for now in our story, um, I was getting ready to ask you around the, t the turn of the 20th century, what happened to CGNP? So throughout the remainder of the 19th century, they basically were running, you know, a couple trains per day, minimal service. Uh, but at uh, just as we were getting to about 1898, 1899, a couple things started to happen. First thing was the uh, Cincinnati Waterworks was starting construction of their new main treatment facility in the California neighborhood, uh, just a couple miles to the east. Yeah. And they needed to be able to bring in construction materials. And the best way to do that was via the Little Miami Railroad, which is right over here. But this CGNP still being narrow gauge, they couldn't run the same cars. Uh, so at the time, they, they and they also had to build a, a little branch line to get to the waterworks because the CGNP was maybe half a mile away. Right. And there was a valley in between where K Kellogg Avenue runs. And so the city built a trestle, leased it to the CGNP, and they started building the branch line. And they also ran another rail uh, so that they could run uh, the standard gauge cars from the Little Miami Railroad to the waterworks, but still using the CGNP's uh, narrow gauge engines. Right, right. So at the same time, for reasons just like that, they decided they didn't want to be narrow gauge anymore uh, because it caused so much problems for interchanging freight. Uh, 
it wasn't really cheaper. In fact, it was even more difficult to get like secondhand cars and locomotives. I was from, gonna ask like yeah. what the rationale behind that was to just go completely off when it's a matter of what, a foot and a half? Two feet maybe? <laughs> right, I, I mean, and it turns out that the savings you get from not having to build your right of way is wide or berms or bridges and trestles was really pretty minor and didn't make up for the fact that they could not interchange yeah. with mainline railroads. And so they started a program to lay a second rail out uh, so that they could do more standard gauge service on the main line. Um, and they were also looking to electrify as well. So basically to turn this short line narrow gauge steam railroad into a standard gauge electric interurban railway. Oh. Uh, much like others that were being constructed from scratch yeah. um, had started in the 1890s and that, because also this route has a handful of steep grades and electric uh, electric cars can generally climb and navigate those better than steam locomotives so that was another thing that started at the time and also opening the branch line to the waterworks put them within uh, striking distance of the California neighborhood. So another potential um, venue for passenger service, but also just past California is Coney Island Amusement Park. And they wanted to try to get in on some of that traffic because also at the time, another interurban was building almost a parallel route, just one block that way on Kellogg Avenue, also to serve Coney Island out to New Richmond with another line up to Mount Washington and out to Bethel. So okay. all areas that were served by the CG&P. So they were basically trying to almost outcompete them and shut them down. Yeah. So they thought, well, the only way we can compete is to electrify and sort of streamline operations, get more passengers and simplify the rail gauge. Yep. The thing is, in order to serve Coney Island, they really needed to be able to run cars all the way to downtown. Because by 1900, people weren't generally coming on the Little Miami Railroad anymore. They were coming by the streetcars, mm -hmm. which by that time had been extended out here to the East End. And the problem, though, is that Cincinnati Street Railway is not standard gauge. It was broad gauge, so five feet, two and a half inches. So in order to run a car from downtown to Coney Island, they needed broad gauge tracks. So for a period of only a couple of months in 1902, the CGNP actually operated three different track gauges all at the same time, narrow, standard, and broad. So here in the yard, there was just an absolute mess right. of tracks and switches right. and broad gauge cars go here, narrow gauge cars go here. These can overlap, some cannot. And so it was simplified once they got rid of the narrow gauge stuff, right. but they still operated standard and broad gauge uh, until the uh, late 19 teens or 19 around the early 1920s. So there was always kind of a mix of tracks and cars and things that could run some places and not others. Right, right, right. So Jeffrey, they did all this, they made these changes all the turn of the century. How does the history play out? So they um, basically spent the next 30 years paying down the debt on the electrification, track gauge, and everything else. Um, they had also opened a couple of branch lines to Batavia. They extended a little farther east of Georgetown to Russellville and also uh, built a subsidiary company, the Felicity and Bethel, which was kind of like a separate company, but it was really another branch line. Uh, but this was all very expensive and they had to get new cars and um, replace a lot of equipment. So it took a lot of, it took a lot of money and uh, it took a long time to pay that back. Uh, so, but also by the 1920s, uh, competition from automobiles, trucks, uh, oh. really started to take a toll. And although they actually lasted 
uh, well into the 1930s, which is later than a lot of other inner urbans in the area, uh, by 1936, uh, they were basically out of business after cutting some of the branch lines, reducing service. And so then they were, they were basically done. So what happened is most of most of the track and stations and everything were scrapped. Uh, but the waterworks actually bought this part of the line from here out to the treatment plant so that they could still haul in uh, chemicals and, and other um, equipment and things that they needed. Uh, they generally didn't uh, haul coal to the waterworks because it's on the river and they could get coal from barges, which was a little cheaper. Right, right, okay. But during high water or things like that, they could they could do that too. But so they abandoned the electrical um, system and used a gasoline switcher engine to bring those cars. But that only lasted until 1943 because those were pretty unreliable. Gotcha. And yeah. so eventually they canceled that the rest of the track was scrapped but then they built this loading platform so that they could um, bring rail cars that would go up the side here and then back in uh, and then use the hoist above us yep. to That's transfer yes it is <laughs> to to transfer from rail cars to a um, truck that would be parked over here and then take, take it to the waterworks uh -huh. and this actually remained active until the mid or late 1990s oh uh not necessarily exclusively for the waterworks right, right. uh although it could have been but so it's only been fairly recently that this actually shut down and it has since been restored uh and is now a trailhead for the ohio river multi-use trail yeah Jeffrey, that sounds like the end of the story, but w what's left? Are there remnants? Is there is there something? Anything? Sure. This this isn't the only thing that's left, but it's it's nice that it's here because this was kind of their main location. Yeah. Uh, but just back up on the um, what was the Little Miami Railroad, then became Pennsylvania, as not and is now Indiana and Ohio. There's still part of the switch and some of the tracks that came out to here. Um, the flood wall uh, at Lunkin Airport, at uh, the south end of the airport, was also basically the root of the tracks. There's still uh, one or two bridge piers at the Little Miami River, um, and the California Woods, um, California Junction hiking trail is actually the old roadbed. Um, it's called California Junction because that's where the split off to the waterworks was. Right, right. And there's not really a whole lot through like Anderson Township and all that. Although in Mount Washington, the um, uh, the old station is still there. It's an American Legion Hall, and a little farther out, sort of past all the suburbanization, um, there's right of way the old uh, Lake Allen where the um, power station was uh, is out in Olive Branch. That's since been drained, but. Um, that's now kind of like a retreat camp of some sort. And so there's other like bridge abutments and right of way berms, that sort of thing. But sort of a lot of the interesting stuff is kind of right, right here and around the airport and up into California woods. Oh, I think we definitely brought the right place for, <laughs> for, for this video for sure. Yeah. And, and even in the waterworks, there's still some tracks there leading to the, um, the river station pump house, which was used to, um, and still is used to bring water from the intakes in the river up to the treatment plant. Um, they had a track that went right into the building so they could bring in the equipment to build the massive uh, steam engines. And a lot of those tracks are still there, although you can't visit them, the waterworks is, uh, generally closed to the public. Right, right. But so, you know, here we've we've got this. The rest of the site is pretty much just woods. But you know, if you know where to look, there's plenty to see. Oh, awesome! <laughs> Thank you for watching another episode of History in Your Own Backyard. I'm your host Susie Selleck here today in Cincinnati, Ohio. Jeffrey Jacowick, thank you so much for joining us. As always, your wealth of information. My pleasure. And remember, travel, travel slowly, slowly and, and stop, stop often. often. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.